Good morning, everybody. I, I am so excited to be here and to have the opportunity to talk to you all for these next couple of minutes and uh, chat about storytelling and social justice and media and representation. So thank you for joining me and listening to me talk. So my name is Jasmine. My friends and family call me Jazz. I also answer to Beyonce, if that's what you want to do. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. So it's rush hour traffic right now. So if you hear any trucks or traffic happening, it's because I live on an extremely busy street. And uh, yeah, I'm the founder and editor of Love Girls Magazine. It's a nonprofit that I started when I was 15. I was a sophomore in high school and we'll, we'll get all into that story, but it is a self-esteem magazine for girls by girls, 13 to 25. And it's something that I started for a few reasons, but at its core, it's, it's a women empowerment and social justice publication that girls do the writing for the photography, the event planning. And we talk about a lot of things, anything that girls are interested in that could be bullying and body image, social justice, racial justice, and, and the girls get the opportunity to write their stories, use their voices and, and, and tell their own personal narratives. And so. It's been nine years of amazingness. It's been the journey of my life. I'm excited to get to share that story with you. I am also a global storyteller at Peace First, which is a global nonprofit organization. A really quick shout out, shameless plug for Peace First. I encourage you to go check out the website if you have time. It's peacefirst.org. And if I have any social entrepreneurs out there, leaders, activists who are maybe looking to get started in your social justice work, or maybe you already have a project that you've been working on and you're looking for some extra support, some extra resources, funding, mentors, anything like that, go to peacefirst.org. You can enter in your project and we give out $250 mini grants no strings attached. Anybody who goes all the way through the journey process will get the funding. And we have some amazing mentors who are also my coworkers there to help you. It's a great opportunity if you're looking for something in social justice or activism. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of different things, sharing my, my personal story, my own narrative, but it's all going to kind of tie back into this idea, this question. And that's, what would the world look like if everyone was able to control their own narrative, right? So what would, what would your, your world look like? What would your social media look like? What would your community look like if you were not only able to control your own story, share your story, but you were able to control your entire narrative? It's a big question. We're going to work through it together. But first, I, I would really, really love to check in with you all. I know there's a lot of people and so we can't do those formal introductions that I love to make me feel no less nervous, but I, I do wanna check in and, and see how you are. So how are you is a question that we all get asked really often. I have a mentor, his name is Eric Dawson and he's also the CEO of Peace First where I work. And he'll always ask me, Jasmine, how are you? And I'll be like, oh, I'm good, I'm good. And he'll be like, no how are you really right and I, I want everybody to be as honest as possible in the chat so we have like a little number system one is i'm feeling awful it's a bad day two is today's not a great day for me three is i'm okay four is i'm feeling good and five is you guys are the stars because you are pumped you're happy it's monday beginning of a new week you guys are fives. I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm a four right now. And I, I truly hope that you are safe, that you're well, that you're healthy, that we're, we're interacting and you're in a good space right now. It's hard times. And I, I completely understand if people are struggling, but if you are struggling, I, I extend some, some love and some light your way. Okay. Let's get started. So uh, my first question, and we're going to use that number ranking system again for you guys to interact with this one, is how important is representation to you, right? Representation in the media is, is about 
the importance and stressing the importance of diversity. Seeing people who look like you, seeing people who sound like you, seeing people who are from the places that you're from, that's representation. And representation matters because when, when, you're, when those identities are put into the media, it shapes the way that different identities, different communities are viewed by society and also how they view themselves, right? So if this resonates with you, you're probably a five. You're like, representation is extremely important. It's critical. Maybe you're a four and you're like, I understand the value of representation. Maybe you're three and it's like, it's important, but it's not critical. Two is little value for me personally, right? And then one is not important at all. For me, I'm a five. Representation is actually what I created my entire nonprofit around Love Girls Magazine. I started it when I was 15, but I can remember way back when I was like seven or eight years old, right? And me and my best friend, her name's Claire, we would steal her older sister's magazines, like Seventeen, Cosmo, uh, Vogue, and we would take them into her room and we'd, we'd be listening to music and flipping through the magazines on the floor. And it was, it was around that time when I really started to uh, see something different in, in media. And I would flip through and I would look at the covers and I love magazine, I love print publishing, but I would never see anybody who looked like me, right? I would never see anybody who had my skin tone. I would never see anybody who had my hair texture. I would never see anybody my height, I'm 5'2". And it, it, ne it didn't necessarily bother me when I was a kid, but it was something that I definitely noticed and internalized a little bit, right? So representation has been something that has been so important to me. And even when I didn't have these big ideas around the definition of representation, it's something that I identified with. So maybe if you think back to TV shows that you used to love when you were younger, were there people who looked like you on them? When you think about the journalists who are in your communities, are there anybody who looks like you? Something to think about. My next question is, how prominent is media bias in your community, right? Media bias is a little bit harder. Media bias or the perceived bias of journalists and news producers, influencers, if you're on social media, I know a lot of you are. It's, it's the selection, right, of the events, the people, the stories that are, that are blown up, that are reported on, and how they're covered, right? when they're covered. So a personal story for me is a few, a few weeks ago, one of the girls who is a part of the magazine, her little sister went missing. She was missing for over 10 days before the media decided to cover it. And that time is critical when somebody, when a little girl goes missing because, you know, the sooner you find them, the sooner people know, the easier it is for people to look. And it was one of those moments where it felt unfair, right? It felt unfair that people weren't talking about this. And that's power, right? Media is power because it, it, it gets to uh, amplify what it wants to amplify. It gets to show what it wants to show, right? And so that, that's why I'm a, I'm a five when we, we, when we talk about media bias. So if you're a five, you see it all around you, right? You're very cognizant of it. You see it. If you're a four, it's an issue in your community. You've, you've recognized that. If you're a three, you know it's something that happens. If you're a two, you rarely see it or hear about it. You, you don't really know much about it. And if you're a one, it doesn't happen where you're from. You don't see it at all. So add those to the chat as well. Okay, so I, I would love to tell you a little bit more about who I am and how I got involved in media and storytelling. And I, I was 15 when I started the magazine. I was a sophomore in high school and my sister was a junior. And my sister, her name is Kayla, she's great. And I remember her coming home from school one day and she was crying and my mom was like, what's wrong? And she's like, I hate it here. High school is awful. People are mean. I, I don't fit in anywhere. 
And I remember her and my mom having this conversation in her room and my room was right next door. So, you know, I was, you know, I was pressed against the wall, my ear pressed against the wall listening. And it was hard to hear her talk about, about not fitting in, about not feeling good about herself, about, about the way that she looked, about the way that she felt about herself. And when that somebody that you love, when you have a sister who you look up to and they don't, they don't see themselves in the way that you see them. It's hard. It's hard. And I felt really helpless at that time because I wanted her to know how amazing she was, right? And she ended up graduating, which was excellent. She went off to college and she, she put those hard days behind her. And the next year, my friend Claire, who we, we were the ones flipping through those magazines, she came to me one day and she said, I can't do this anymore. She wanted to switch schools. She didn't want to be here on earth anymore with us. She was in a really, really dark, really, really hard spot with her mental health. And it, it felt like it was happening all over again, right? It felt like, it felt like people that I loved, people who I knew were amazing, didn't see that in themselves. And she talked about how cyberbullying was really getting to her. If you, if you are around my age, a little bit younger, a little bit older, you'll remember MySpace and when Facebook was starting to come up. And cyberbullying was a huge issue. It was the height of the cyberbullying epidemic and, and people were really struggling and, and young people were mean when they were behind the keyboard. And so I wanted to create a space where young women could come together and they could support each other and they could actually talk right? And they could actually see each other for who they were. And they, and they could share their own stories and, and comfort and confidence that, that they can own their identities, right? And so that's how the magazine was born. Yep, we've been doing it for nine years. It's been a long time, but it's, it's been amazing. I was born addicted to drugs, right? So my mother was I was born in 1995, which was when people would would classify as like the height of war on drugs. And my mother was addicted to cocaine. She was addicted to crack. And I was immediately put into the foster care system when I was born. I was in the foster care system for five years, and then I was I was adopted by my amazing family, my mom, my dad, and of course my older sister Kayla. And I was really fortunate for that to happen um, to me because a lot of young people actually don't make it out of the foster care system, especially after five. I was applying for scholarships in my senior year of high school. And if, if you're in college or you're going to college or you, you finish college, you know that student loans are awful. So scholarship money was very important to me. So I was applying for some scholarships and I was looking for scholarships that kind of supported young people who had been in the foster care system. In the state of Illinois, where I'm from, they have one that's the DCFS scholarship and they were giving out 58, 58 scholarships. And I remember sending the link to my foster brother, a young man who I had grown up in foster care with. And I was like, look at this opportunity. We were about the same age and I was like, we should apply. And so we were very excited. We applied. I ended up getting the scholarship. It was full tuition for all four years at a state institution. And I ended up going to college in the fall, which wouldn't have happened for me and my family if I hadn't received that money. I remember wrapping up my first year at university and I had gotten a phone call saying that my foster brother was in prison. And it, it felt wrong, right? That I was grad, I was, I was finishing my first year and he was behind bars and it brought me back to this moment, right? We were at an awards banquet for the same scholarship and there was a woman on stage and she was like, you are the 58 young people out of 500 who received this scholarship in the state of Illinois. And parents were clapping and young people were cheering. We were all proud of ourselves. And I'm not good at math, right? But I remember sitting there thinking to myself, okay, 58 out of, out of 500, meaning what happens to the other 450 people who don't receive that scholarship? And that was my foster brother. 
And so I, I, I went on um, to my senior year of college and I was a Soros Justice Youth Activist Fellow. And I, I got to answer some of these questions about foster care and about the foster care to incarceration pipeline and what happens to young people who are lost in those systems. It, it turns out only 3% of young people who are in foster care actually go on to graduate at all. That means 97% will never get a college degree. So I feel really fortunate as a, as a graduate of the University of Illinois in Chicago, but it was the idea about these narratives, right? What does it mean to have come from foster care? Right? What does it mean to have been a young person who is exposed to drugs as a baby and, and, and have a mother who was addicted to drugs? Right? What does it mean to be a 15-year-old Black girl starting a nonprofit? It, it was these preconceived notions that I had about myself, right? The, these preconceived stereotypes that others have about foster care, drugs, young people, right? And, and where do we get those ideas from? Who shapes those ideas? It's the media. It's the stories that we're exposed to. It's the books that we read. It's the TV shows that we watch. It's the movies that we see. Media is so powerful. And, and what would it look like if everybody was able to control their own narrative, whether they were from foster care? If they, if they told that story, if I told that story about being addicted to drugs when I was a baby, and if I told my story about being 15 and starting a nonprofit, right? So what happens when we recreate the story around preconceived stereotypes given to us and our different identities? I, I would love to see, hear some of your answers in the chat below. I would also love to hear some identities that, that you, you know that you have and there are preconceived notions around them and they don't have to be as deep as foster care, right? They, maybe, maybe you play football. There are probably some preconceived notions and stereotypes around that. And maybe, maybe you dance, maybe you cheerlead, maybe you're in theater. Add, add some of those into the chat and, and think about what those mean for you and how you identify around those. And maybe some stories that you've seen in the media that aren't necessarily representative of who you are. They say 15 year olds can't start their own nonprofits, right? But this is my story. This is me at 15. <laughs> and this is Anna and she's 15 and she was just featured in the magazine a few, a few issues ago and she was very proud. And I never knew when I started the magazine, when I started my project, my, my, my small business, that me sharing my story and telling my story could impact young people like Anna, who actually also came from the foster care system. You know, they say people with dyslexia can't be editors, right? I grew up moderately dyslexic. If you don't know what dyslexia is, it's, it's technically a, a learning disability where it's harder to differentiate letters and numbers, can't read clocks, manual clocks, can't sight read music. I'm classically trained in the piano, so you could imagine the struggle. They say people with dyslexia can't be editors, right? But here we are. Been, been an editor for nine years now, creating some beautiful art, getting to help girls use their voice, tell their stories. And it's been, it's been fantastic. And I, I challenge you to think about what happens when you overcome those stereotypes that were put against you, right? I have this idea around moments of obligation, right? And what moral obligation means and and these are some of my girls they're very happy they're at girls on fire <laughs> but this is this is something for my creatives right something for my social entrepreneurs if you're out there something for marketers branders authors news reporters if that's what you want to do journalists artists activists leaders i know you're here i i have two things around moral obligation that i, I want to challenge you with the first one is what what happens when we all tell our representative non-biased authentic stories for ourselves and how could you as a leader an artist a creative help other people tell their authentic non-biased representative stories 
how can you help create that platform? I, I think that because of the nature of our work, because of who we are and what we do, we have this moral obligation to do that. And, and that's how we can create media that is equitable and just, right? So lastly, I, I wanna invite you to a, a really amazing tool. It's called Get Media Lit. It is something that a really good friend of mine and Spuds actually, his name is Tony Weaver Jr. He, he created as a part of his organization, Weird Enough Productions. It's getmedialit.com and it teaches you all about media literacy, right? It teaches you about how to be represent, how to represent others and, and how to be diverse and, and how to tell equitable stories and also how to, how to find stories that aren't equitable and how to identify when things aren't what they should be.